Hello, social workers, mental health professionals, and change agents. Welcome to another episode of the Social Work Rants Podcast. I'm your host, Bash Moreno. Saludos a todos. Greetings, everybody. Thank you for tuning in, tapping in wherever you are watching or listening to this podcast. I appreciate all the love and support. Uh, gracias a todos por su apoyo. Espero que todo está bien. De, de salud y de, y de su salud mental. Um, that being said, uh, get the disclaimer out the way because I always forget to, to say it. <laughs> uh, this podcast is not to be used as a substitute for individual or, or any sort of group therapy or counseling if you are in need of assistance by all means call 988 if you have a therapist call your therapist if you have a psychiatrist call your psychiatrist if you need uh like i said call 988 if you need to call 911 left for death emergency call 911 for all my uh out of the u.s viewers and, and listeners whatever your emergency contact is by all means Use that, get the help that, that you need. It's okay not to be okay, but definitely get the help that that you need. Um, uh, that being said, uh, follow the podcast on all social media outlets, uh, Instagram, uh, the Social Work Rants podcast. That is all one word. Uh, Twitter, a.k.a. X, whatever Elon decides to call it. Uh, at Social Work Rants, and, and hit the like button uh, on Facebook, aka Meta, at the Social Work Rants Podcast, hit that like button. Uh, shout out to everybody that's been liking the the page; has been uh, growing quite steadily uh, recently. So again, I appreciate all the love and support. Uh, t shirt is out; is nice and clean. Uh, <laughs> uh, go to Triumph Through Pain dot Shopify dot com for your podcast t shirt and also hoodie because it's hoodie season, even though this weather doesn't know how to act but it was one week is like 80 degrees then the next week is like waking up to the 40s and 50s so uh but definitely is out like if you're in a cold area definitely get, get your hoodie out uh get your t-shirts um and yes we got uh uh montage this podcast uh, somehow so, <laughs> some some way um that uh being said and of course uh my poetry book uh trying through pain how to maximize your full potential during heart um in hard times uh, is available in paperback and i actually been uh, finally recording the audio book so it'll, it'll be uploaded soon and uh, uh come up with a date to release it definitely uh by the end by, 20, by the end of this calendar year it'll be out if you're an audio book person and get that book and of course uh, the uh, amazon bestseller latinx and social work volume two i uh, one of the Contributing authors, that book is is also available. Um, it is on my my link tree in the podcast uh, bio. So definitely get get your copy of, of that that book as well. Now, with all that being said, my guest at this time, uh, we were talking about uh, entrepreneurship and social work and getting that paper, getting that money somehow, uh, some way. Uh, we social workers can get money, and we like. We're slowly learning. We're getting there. We're getting there. Um, uh, Shara Ruffin, how you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you? Good. It's it's not like we, we were just talking before I hit the record button. Uh, we've been following <laughs> each other. I think at almost every single platform, <laughs> but finally to virtually finally meet, uh, you know, face to face and actually have a conversation. It was, it was great finally uh, meeting you. Well, it's great to meet you too. It's nice to play the voice with the name. Yes, so name with the face. Thank you for having me on. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> besides the picture, besides the profile picture. On the right. <laughs> I'm like, who's this person doing all this stuff? That's great. <laughs> no, but but it's amazing how uh, you know if you use social media you know, correctly and stuff instead of just nonsense that you can meet dope people who are doing. Uh, dope amazing work and kind of see and kind of take notes and like oh I could do this I could do that and kind of like try to put it in practice and put your spin to it and and mm -hmm. you know support each other in, in, in this field because you know we it's crazy out there in these streets right now <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's interesting the landscape of the economy right now so um, we talk a lot uh, on social media, I see, um, you know, people really talking about now that 
social workers can make money and really breaking that glass ceiling of, you know, we're just in it for what's the old saying? Saying we're goes, in it for the outcome, we're not for the not, income. <laughs> yes, yes. Mm-mm. <laughs> So, you know, it, it's it's something I often talk to my colleagues, um, my social work clients, and even my mentees about, um, because if I have to think about what my own journey was, it was pretty much learning that and learning it very fast. Mm. For for those who, who don't know who, who you are and what you do in our, our wonderful field, let, let people know who you are. Sure. So hi, everybody. My name is Shara. I am the CEO and founder of Dream to Licensure. I'm also a LinkedIn advisor. I help people with professional development. Well, my colleagues, I do exam coaching, as well as I am the top voice of social work on LinkedIn. So I wear many hats. Yep. So I am excited to be here. And I'm also an author. Oh, so we'll get into that. I'm curious to know what (laughs) <laughs> how how do you manage to? Because I know LinkedIn, uh, I've been uh, trying to be very consistent, especially within like the last, I would say like the last year and a half, and just hearing about LinkedIn, how people like using LinkedIn to meet people. I, like I've had uh, interviews from podcast interviews as a result of just mm. reaching out to people for on LinkedIn. Like how how do you manage to, to be like a, a voice? For LinkedIn? Um, so. I mean, I guess I could start with what the story was for me on LinkedIn. I mean, my journey with LinkedIn, just like anyone else, kind of started with just looking for a job. This is back in 2018 when I was an outpatient therapist. Um, And I was posting a lot of mental health content at the time. Um, I wrote an article. Articles were really big back then on LinkedIn called uh, mostly focusing on the military. I'm a former military spouse and talking about some of the stigma, mental health struggles that uh, military spouses go through, the family, as well as the service members. And I shared that story and it blew up. And I was like, there's something here. I'm going to start sharing more mental health stories. And that's what I did uh, for the first year that was on LinkedIn. And I was still working a full time job. I was still um, dealing with being a single mother and trying to just built my clinical tool bag, um, as well as get my clinical hours. So I was juggling a lot back then at the time while still actively being engaging on LinkedIn and building that presence. It, it was constantly being on LinkedIn. And at the time it was just mental health content. I met a LinkedIn influencer. She had a million followers at the time in 2019. And she said, you have 30,000 connections and what are you doing with them? I said, The only thing I'm doing is, you know, engaging, putting out mental health education value. And she said something that didn't really hit home until later. She said, you are, you're on LinkedIn. No one knows who you are. You have 30,000 connections, but they don't trust you. They don't hear your voice. They don't know your mannerisms. And I'm like, so what? Um, (laughs) I'm okay with that. And she said, you need to do video for 90 days. I will never forget. I said, she must be crazy. I don't have that type of time for that. <laughs> um, and then I did my first 90 days of video. The first video was me talking about how uncomfortable I was doing video. And during that time, I was transitioning from full-time work into, because I ended up getting my hours to actually um being to a part-time job that I had at a residential facility. And I started sharing more of that story because I had a lot of frustration regarding the licensing exam. Um, And the more I shared about that journey, the more people started to follow. Uh, The more I became more vulnerable and sharing pieces of my everyday through video, the more people, the more, um, I guess, influence I started to get. And the more I started to connect with people. So my LinkedIn journey, especially being a social worker, where social workers, you know, they're more visible now, but not on LinkedIn. Um, So very much. It's a handful, yeah. Yeah, it's a handful. And I'm always talking to my guys like, "Mm -mm, we need to fix this profile (laughs) because to say right, because there's a lot of opportunity on LinkedIn, unlike any other platform. Mm -hmm. Um, If you're an entrepreneur, if you're a business owner, if you're a private practice, that's where the money is. Your clients are there. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's a whole another piece of that journey, but, uh, yeah, in terms of being, getting anointed, I guess I would say a couple of weeks ago, getting the LinkedIn top voice in social work, being the first a woman of color, the first social worker in the field to get that recognition for all the work I've been, uh, putting in, in my 20 years in social work, 
as well as being active on a platform, um, I didn't expect. Um, but it's one that I appreciate um, and being consistent on a platform and um, showing in my work with my colleagues, having a past our board exams, helping my colleagues um, reach their potential beyond the licensure um, and my passion for it because of what my struggles were is probably the most uh, profound part of my journey. Mm. Can you share a little bit of, of, about that that journey? Because I, I make no bones about it, share my my struggles with with the exam and did a whole episode mm-hmm. of how I finally you know, got licensed. You know, shout out to the mm-hmm. wonderful state of, of Delaware for that. But what mm-hmm. was your what was your experience like? So um, I graduated from Howard University in 2010, a decade ago. And back then, licensing wasn't a big thing. Um, still living in D.C. And at the time, it Shout just, out to HU. Shout out to HU. Yes, yes, <laughs> HU, yes, you yes, know. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And back then, I really didn't think much of the licensure. I was like, whatever, I'm just going to work. And I wasn't making much money as a HIV medical case manager. It was my first job out of grad school. Oh, nice. The following year, it's like, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and take the licensing. Um, I took it at 8 o'clock in the morning. Um, I, there was a, a workshop at Howard that I attended. And I missed it by three points. Mm. And I'm in my early 20s. So like, whatever, uh, whatever. And I didn't take it again for another almost two years um and I was like you know what my life is in a different turning point I need to do this again I studied for three months um resigned from my job because it was high stress um I had a generalized anxiety disorder at the time Mm -hmm. um and I just couldn't do both I didn't have any kids or anything so I was like I'm gonna go ahead take this thing again three months I studied like it was a job um eight hours breakfast lunch dinner break um, listening to an audio uh, to reinforce what I was learning. Um, and I had to rewrite my study guide into a form that I could understand, which took two months before I could even start studying. So really five months. <laughs> and I passed um, in June of 2013. Then life took another course. Um, I ended up getting married a couple of years later, getting divorced. Um, I had two children. One was a stillborn um, mm-hmm. during my ex-husband's deployment in Afghanistan. There's the military piece. Then I had a child that was medically compromised the following year. This is when my marriage started to fall apart. Um, my son was compromised at six months. Um, I was told by the doctor he may not make it to his first birthday. Mm-hmm. And he did. He's now almost 10 next year. But at the time he had surgery, he was colic. If, if, if you don't have any children, colic just means that that child is very irritable, um, and nothing can really calm them down for much. Um, so my son for the next, till he was about two years old, just crying profusely. He had a tube sticking out of his left side, um, to do drainage of his kidney. Um, and for the next five years, I was in and out the hospital while working a full-time job as an outpatient therapist at a partial hospital program. Um, where it was very hard because I didn't have a car. Most of my money either went to taking care of my son or it went into building my specializations, which I have now. Um, and for what I remember that part of my journey, it was debilitating, very depressing. I could be charged a therapist until four o'clock in the afternoon. And then I am running to get my son who pinned me sick three hours away from home and a two buses in the train uh, to get to him because I couldn't afford to get a car. And walking a mile, because my my hospital was in a tractor trailer park. Mm-hmm. Um, so not only did I have to walk, uh, take the bus and the train, but I also had a mile and a half to walk to work after this deep, dark road that I had to walk um, and just be on the side and make sure there's tractor trails coming back and forth and then crossing I-95 and Roosevelt Boulevard. Like you got four lanes of traffic you're having to cross mm-hmm. every day. Um, that was about three, four years of that because my hospital went from, they transferred from one place to another. And at the end of that time with them, life scabies, bed bugs, all types of things I had to deal with. Um, I'll leave that story to imagination um, of what I had to deal with. It was a high stress level job. I loved it, but it took a lot from me in terms of time with my son. He grew up the first five years, I didn't miss his first words. I missed him walking for the first time. Um, I worked a lot. Um, when I left that job, it was 
five supervisors because it was high turnover to get my hours. It was an MFT, LPC, two LCSWs, a side D, and I believe um, it was another psychologist. So it was about five of them. Mm. And I remember flying down to one of them to get my hours done and say, hey, you need to sign off on my hours because I need to, my board is telling me, you got five more months. I'm like, no, I don't. I'm done. I'm exhausted. I'm burnt out. I am through with this part of my journey. I love the job, but it's high stress level. And there's something else for me. And I don't know what that is, but it's time for me to go. Um, that was August, 2019. When I left that job after taking a weekend to fly down to my former supervisor, have those hours signed off on a pretty beach in Florida, fly back home, <laughs> Turn those hours in and um, I left the job. I took the exam for the first time and missed it by two points in November, 2019. Mm -hmm. I am now devastated because of how the 10 year span, really nine years at the time of what it took for me to get to that point. Mm -hmm. Personal challenges, uh, grief and loss, being a mother, going through divorce, postpartum depression, almost giving myself for adoption. Um, mm -hmm. Just so many losses that I had. And when I, just the C fail, I needed 102 in Pennsylvania and I had 100. I was crushed. So for the next nine months, I did nothing but play Animal Crossing because I'm a gamer. Um, Cause that was a big thing back then during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, I took a part-time job. I was gonna take the test over in March, 2020, but the pandemic hit. Right. I lost my part-time job. I lost my insurance, pretty much every, <laughs> almost everything. So I was home with constant migraines. Um, there were times where I was taking six to eight, et cetera, and, um, per day because I was too afraid to go to a doctor because I couldn't afford one. I was home with three kids who were homeschooling and I was taking care of them in bed with depression, exacerbated by migraines. And in August, 2020, it came to a point that said, Char, you need to figure something else out. This is not working. You haven't come this far just to stop. Um, I was emotionally exhausted and I decided to apply for um, state insurance, got a psychiatrist, got a therapist, found out I had ADHD combined type, which explained a lot of my memory um, loss and needing a structured, systematic way of uh, processing information um, and took medicine for the first time in my life. And as a former therapist, that oxymoron of mm -hmm. taking medicine for a test is what I fought with as a black woman, um, taking ADHD, um, a non stimulus Shutera, taking Lexapro. And November 9th, no, November 8th, 2020 is when I passed my exam. Um, I got accommodations an extra hour due to the ADHD and the generalized anxiety disorder. Fought with the board uh, because they were like, well, why do you need accommodations? And I fought for them. I said, hey, you can have my psych records. Here's everything. I need the time. Mm -hmm. um, ASW didn't disclose that accommodations. My neuropsychologist told me this. So that was my journey with the exam. That whole year, mind you, I'm on LinkedIn doing videos, talking about my depression, talking about being broke, talking about being a mom. And I'm showing all of that in real time. So what ended up happening is because I spent a whole year of showing that that journey of being stuck, broke, post failing my exam, when I told everybody all my connections, like, hey, I'm going to pass this exam. And then, mm. It's like telling a small stadium of people that you're going to pass. It's like 30,000 at a time and I fail. It's disappointing. Mm. So I shared that journey and video a whole year to the T in that post of when I passed my exam, it blew up. So when it blew up, I decided to get on Clubhouse. Clubhouse was popping at the time. Right. Um, this is January 2021. At my same LinkedIn um, mentor said, you know, Clubhouse. And I got on Clubhouse and I started sharing that story, that journey of what it took for me to get my LCSW. And I didn't realize how much of an impact it had. And I started coach, just coaching for free on there for the first six months. And people started passing their exams. Mm -hmm. And then I had another coach say, hey, uh, what you doing? I said, um, I'm helping people out. It's like, you're still broke. You're still, uh, you still got mouths to feed. You probably want to turn this into something viable since you're not doing anything else. I, I wasn't in private practice. I was just helping people out on Clubhouse, losing days, nights, sunsets, sunrises, <laughs> just helping people out. And uh, because I felt this, this urge to 
want to help as many of my colleagues, especially those that look like me as much mm. as possible. And it turned into <laughs> quite a holistic approach to licensing that came from that story. Mm. And three years later, it's still booming. <laughs> so yeah, that's the story with Journey to License, how well, Journey to License was born. Well, thank you for your transparency of sharing uh, your story. Uh, uh, my condolences for, for your losses. Um, and I can't even imagine you, you, uh, you know, you going through, through that. Um, and, and still, and, and this kind of like what I was kind of talking about regarding, um, you know, my Latinx and social work, uh, volume two chapter about, you know, myself going through, uh, you know, eventually getting divorced myself, uh, you know, with two kids and, and, you know, working, you know, supporting like the whole family or um, you know, my, my ex-wife, you know, God rest her soul, you know, going through uh, addiction because of uh, drugs and alcohol as a result of, you know, being, being in pain, being hooked on painkillers after having a C-section and kind of, and, and that whole journey of, of, of that. And eventually you know, like, I can't do this anymore. Like, you know, getting divorced about being an outpatient therapist and then being laid off and having a, a, a friend who's also a, a, one of my neighbors, you know, completed suicide during the same time period and, and moving back home from New Jersey, back to New York. My parents were two small kids and kind of like, and then, you know, she, she ended up passing away and is like becoming like a single parent that, and dealing with kids who are going through grief and, and, and loss and, and all that. So, uh, we go through a lot and, and sometimes like we, we need to share those stories cause we, we're just as, you know, we're human and, uh, those stories need to be told and, you know, you know, our, you know, our, our supervisors and program directors and whatever, you know, need to give us grace because we're the ones doing, doing the work. And, you know, we're, we're at a time, you mentioned the economy in the very beginning, like, no, we had a time, like people are not taking any crap anymore. And it's like, all right, like, <laughs> more, probably more than ever. And like, all right, I'm out and, or we, or we'll use our skills and create stuff. So like your journey, like, and you know, creating you know, a program for people to pass their exam is you know, a great example of that. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for sharing your journey and my condolences regarding your ex-wife. And it's just, it's definitely hard. Um, unfortunately, my ex husband's still around. <laughs> you might have to edit that off the podcast. <laughs> But that's a whole other that's a whole other podcast episode. But you know, you gotta have a little fun here. No, Um, of course. No. So yeah, I I think it's important for people to know that we're human. That was one of the other reasons what that I shared so much on LinkedIn, as much as I did on LinkedIn. Um, because that platform, people think, you know, oh that you shouldn't share that on LinkedIn. I remember one time I shared a story of my ex-husband um, during our marriage, finding out that he had a baby during the marriage. Mm. And someone scrolling and they were like, what? Usually I would scroll past this content, but mm. I shared some of the valid points of how important it is to heal. Because in that, that divorce, I found um, my high school sweetheart, uh, we're mm. actually engaged to be married. Um, I've known him since I was 16 years old, but in finding love again and learning how to trust again and, and healing, it took, it was a fight. Mm -hmm. So in sharing those real stories, it connects people in a way that I think is very important that often social workers shy away from because we're trained, right? To not disclose. (laughs) Disclose, exactly. Yeah. And, and for me, it was something that I used to get in trouble a lot (laughs) as a therapist um, because a lot of my clients look like me. Mm. Um, most of my staff, um, well, not my staff, but most of my colleagues, they were white and I was the only black social worker at the time and nothing shows my colleagues. I love them. They did great work, but there was a disconnect between the, the marginalized community that they served. Mm-hmm. And then there was me. And I remember having one of my schizophrenic clients ask, and he was a black male and said, why aren't there more black therapists? Why aren't there more mm. black social workers? And at the time, that was a question I could not really answer for him. Um, so when I think about in terms of my work as a social worker, um, 
providing an alternative way to look at testing holistically, um, combining my skills as a former therapist, someone who has personally struggled with testing um, and needing a hands-on approach uh, has been a different game changer in when it came to exam coaching for me. And one that I really didn't realize it would have the impact that it did. Um, to give you a couple of prime examples um, of that, Shannon Schreiber, who was my first deaf client um, back in June, 2021, I was, you know, things were just popping off and I was in my first six months. She reaches out to me through LinkedIn. She says, hey, Shara, I think you can help me. And at the time I didn't know she was deaf, we got on a call and it was her male interpreter. I was like, oh, I don't know if I'm going to be, in my mind, I'm like, I don't know if I can help her because I don't know American <laughs> Sign Language. She says, no, I think you can help me. And we worked together seven weeks through an interpreter twice a week. She passes her exam. What I didn't know about Shannon Shriver is that her husband had died from prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And she had two small boys to take care of. And if she didn't pass this exam, she would be, I'm quite sure, in jeopardy of losing a job. Mm -hmm. She not only passed the exam, it was her first time taking it. Mm -hmm. So um, another example I could give is Tamisha Tate, who's on my podcast. She was a social worker, pastor, Boris. She's blind. She was in my group coaching program. Um, and she popped up in my clubhouse study group room that I run every week. And she's like, Shara, um, I passed my exam. And I didn't even know this lady was blind. She said, and I'm like, huh? She's like, I'm blind. I can't. I was like, what? You're blind. So she came up in the middle of a study session on clubhouse. And she comes up and shares her story. Um, I've had somebody pass her exam. She was at 11 times taking her LCSW. Mm. Um I've had so many different social workers who needed a more holistic approach. Now, exam coaching programs that are exam study, self-study programs, I'm sure you know all the popular ones, they're great. The missing component for some people, I think, is I get a lot of colleagues contacting me, I've used this person, I've used that. They're using way too many things and they're not focused on how I learn best. What do I actually need? And realizing that someone else's jerk passing or failure journey is not mine. Hmm. There's a lot of noise on it and, and misconceptions when it comes to the licensing exam. And what the, one of the key questions I get asked when it comes to the exam is what, do, what study material do I choose? And I'm, I'm very honest with people when that question comes and I say, how do you learn best? If it's a self-study program that you can do on your own, you may not have kids. You may not me, what I have, and I'll let them know. Some, a lot of us don't know how to study, especially if we come from um, marginalized communities where we're dealing with some of the systematic things that come when it comes to educational background, which I know I had to deal with. Um, that's a lot of what I get in consultation clause is I have ADHD and some of my colleagues may not even know they have a diagnosis that's keeping them from passing the exam or they don't know how to study or if they don't know how to strategize. And for some people, it's just really holding the space for them until they feel they, they can do this. An example I could give is Steffi Imbram. She's actually on my LinkedIn page, one of my recommendations. She had ADHD combined type. She missed her exam by one point twice. Mm. When I met her, she was on her third try. And we met for about two months straight, consistently doing coaching, building a structure, tailoring it to her. And she said, Shara, I'm doing my practice test. I keep timing out on a Sunday on my day off. I said, look, lady, we didn't, <laughs> we have done the structure. I know you can do this because I've seen you do this. We're going to sit here. I'm going to be on Zoom with you. I'm going to pretend to be a test proctor and you're going to do these questions and you're going to get faster. So every question she had, I would say, you're going to get faster. We're going to do this again. We're going to do this again. For five hours, I was on the call with her mm. or on the Zoom with her, and she passed the following week on her third try. Some people need a more holistic way based on what they need. A lot of the self-study programs don't provide that. They're self-study. What I provide is a more tailored approach. Even in a group setting, I provide more of a tailored approach. I'm able to tell someone based on the practice exam where they need to study, how they need to study, based on where they are. Um, I once had a guy whose name is Jermaine. He had six kids. He's a program director. He's pressured. 
he's freaking out. He doesn't know how to study. And he's like, Char, I, I heard you do really well with testing. I need your help. Come in with a teller structure, looking at his schedule, seeing where he could fit in the time to study, making a teller schedule as a busy parent, which I know about having three kids to have to balance those things with and still study. Um, it can look different for different people. And that's where I usually come in. So I, I never say I'm a tutor because tutor work with one framework. Mm-hmm. Me, I'm more multifaceted and working with where they are at the time. Yeah, I, I like that. Um, and, it, and it's so important because, yeah, like you, I know for myself, like I got to like listen to it and see it at the same time that like it really like it really hit, hits me better than just reading it and trying to memorize it or just looking at it at a screen or something or but not like I need to do kind of like both at the same time like oh okay I kind of get it and like hear a voice while seeing the words as I'm reading so that's interesting mm-hmm. I like that how how can people um get in contact with you to, if they were interested in working with you to pass that damn exam <laughs> <laughs> Well, um, I know by the time this comes out, if they're looking to test within this year, I do want to say that um, I'm not sure if you follow ASW, but they're transitioning from before I go into where people can find me. Um, Pearson View is no longer going to be the test provider. It's going to be PSI. Um, So there's going to be a blockout date between December 16th and January 2nd where there's no testing at all. So I've been telling people I probably need to do a live tonight to share like, hey, if you're trying to test this year, you need to test in the next seven to eight weeks. Mm -hmm. Um, If not, you're going to be testing in the new year. Um, So I just want to say that on your podcast, they can, if they want to Google PSI and if ASW changes to do that, um, because the evidence is right there, they want to make sure that they test within the next seven to eight weeks if they want to test this year. Um, Other than that, there's always a new year. But other than that, people can find me. I'm on TikTok. I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on uh, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube. Uh, podcast is on every other podcast platform. Um, all the major platforms I am on. So Clubhouse, I'm there every Monday. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm pretty much everywhere, my friend. <laughs> if you go put people plug in my name, Shara Ruffin, my name will come up in Google. Yes, Google. I said Google me. <laughs> oh, so you, you try to be funny. Um, you're trying to be funny, but yeah, I can actually say that now. Like Google me. Um, my business has been in Business Insider, USA Today, Success Magazine as well. So, oh, that's dope. um, people would see those things come up. So yeah, very which exciting a, stuff. Which is a perfect segue for this uh, inaugural uh, social work wealth conference. That's coming up October nineteenth and twentieth, and we were both uh, a part of that. I'll be uh, uh, moderating, and uh, as of this recording, uh, Ava's like, "Can you do a moderating for something else too?" So, I'm like, <laughs> like, sure, why not? <laughs> so, why not? so, um, just tell what 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 you're gonna be be doing. Talk about it, like, um. Uh, yeah, so just let people know what, what you're doing at, at the conference. So I'll basically be sharing, um, you know, how you can turn your brand story into a six-figure business. Uh, that's what I was able to do with uh, my business during to licensure. I'm actually getting ready to scale and expand it. Um, but what I hope what people will get from my story, at least during the conference, is knowing that you don't have to be a broke social worker. Um and that it is a stigma that we have to continue to break because, you know, there's a societal stigma there and that the hone in on those gifts because they are transferable. Social workers have many skills that are transferable. Mm-hmm. Um, so I would hope that when I do share a little bit of my story with people um, that they get they get some hope, some takeaways from it. So I'm, I'm excited to be able to share it after almost three years of doing the work. No, that, that's awesome. I'm I'm looking for forward to to hearing that, and, and <laughs> that's the whole conference. It's definitely uh, 
I've been talking about it the last few weeks on, on the podcast. I had different people on who, who are actually going to be a part of the conference. So uh, it's uh, ex- exciting, uh, exciting times that we're in in terms of social work, mixing social work and entrepreneurship. And, yet, and like you said, using the uh, all the skills that we already have and kind of like, oh, I could do that. I could do that. <laughs> and I've done this. I've done this. And like, and like kind of like finally social workers i'm still learning but social workers actually finally putting two and two together like i'm using like you said using the transferable skills to uh do stuff that social work kind of like base or framework but you're doing something else and not necessarily uh in social work and actually uh make money because we we we're in it for the income as much as the the outcome <laughs> Yeah, it's it's okay to, it's something I had to learn and learn fast is there's a social work card and there's the business, right? So Mm -hmm. being able to have a healthy balance between them both um, and asking for help and and mentorship is very important. I've had plenty of them. So um, knowing your market, doing your market research and really focusing on the value you can give. Mm -hmm. Um, Because for me, I... I was that's just in our marketing room where we were talking about this and I'm like, I'm not a marketer. I had a story. Um, I share that story consistently, willingly, unapologetically. Um, and it bursts a totally different trajectory than I ever thought it would based on that story and what I could bring to the table for the people that I served. And it helps me market and corner market in a different way because of it. Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, that, that that that's uh so important. Uh, going back to LinkedIn real quick. Um, <laughs> it's like, let's go back to LinkedIn. <laughs> no, be, no, because LinkedIn was was always like, it's something like just to have, and people like forgot about it, and people just focused yeah. on, on like it was like no Instagram, fa- TikTok, Facebook. And it was like Facebook, Facebook. Then it was like Instagram, and then it was like no. No, Twitter was popping until mm-hmm. like Eli bought it and, and messed it up. And, and <laughs> it's, oh, it's, oh, it's especially so, so, hashtag social work. Uh, Twitter has not been the same mm-hmm. since he <laughs> since he bought it. Like, <laughs> um, that's 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 a fact. <laughs> um, but yeah, so so LinkedIn was like, oh, something like you open, you open, like you have it, but like you don't use it. And then like, I guess mm-hmm. like the last few years, like it's really, they get on LinkedIn, then get on LinkedIn. And there's all this, like I see more and more people talk about it and kind of like use it. And then I'm like, mm-hmm. what should I, do? I see people getting all these like opportunities and I've been using LinkedIn. And I was like, <laughs> and then I, I started there listening to like, tw- like you mentioned 2019, 2020. 2021 um i've been like listening to uh gary gary v uh, podcast Mm -hmm. and and, like just like loved it and he's always like oh like scale and everything you gotta use linkedin is like definitely the most organic reach in terms of everybody so i was like all right let me like let me (laughs) let me put put some stuff up but my podcast stuff and then my book came out put it on put it on there and kind of like you know making these connections and actually like reaching out to people and having people on the podcast and it, so yeah it's been it's been been growing so I, I, I love the fact I'm, that. A, I'm gonna show you some things when we pop off this podcast I'm just, okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah I mean LinkedIn has such an organic reach Gary Vee is actually one of my favorites um in terms of you know, building a brand and sharing his story the way he did uh, many years ago when social media, especially Twitter and his wine uh, library and everything. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's important that people understand that um, money comes and goes, right? It, you can make money. There are so many different ways. Maintaining it is another, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, um, but making money to me is the easy part. It's the maintaining it. It's learning how to business structure. Cause that's something I was kind of like thrown into. I was like, I don't have an MBA. Um, learning to get a, you know, a CPA, getting bit people around you that can support your journey. Um, Cause it's going to get hard. Mm-hmm. Um, and it gets, for me, it got really lonely when I started to have 
uh, different things happen to me, like my five-time Amazon best-selling book got ripped off uh, on <laughs> on Amazon. It was somebody who had changed the the covers and, and it had some weird looking writing on the inside and was trying to corner the market on myself when I came open my social work journals or having impostors try to rip away at your client testimonies. And my first year was full of uh, a lot of challenges, um, especially now that I'm trademarking and finding out somebody's trying to uh, use their Google traffic with your name, but no, mm. nothing to say there. But, you know, you find that the more you grow, um, people are watching you. Um, so I, I would caution people, please, for your love of your life, please trademark everything. Trademark your name, get your domain name. You don't know what type of impact you're going to have later. Um, it's important to protect your work as you're doing it. Um, I have a lawyer. Finally, um, it's just it, it's it's been a whirlwind ride for me. I've enjoyed it, being able to do things that a lot of my colleagues are only dreaming of that can become their reality. So I'm very excited um, in the near future. Uh, doing a LinkedIn cohort for just social workers. Mm -hmm. I'm really teaching them how to leverage the platform, especially now that I've been able to do it um, consistently for a couple of years now. Um, so I'm very excited to be able to share those insights with my colleagues very soon. I'm looking forward to, to that. So yeah, there's a lot of tr tricks regarding like LinkedIn. I actually saw a TED talk about some that I went in person a year and a half ago, seemed like more than that, um, about like the first connections and then the second connections and then the third connections, like way like mm -hmm. you could see who, who's following who and kind of like, there was a whole thing about it. I was like, oh snap, that that's actually really interesting. And kind of like build your own connections just based on that. So mm -hmm. it's, 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 a lot of, it's a lot of stuff <laughs> regarding that. It is, but you can be a very overwhelmed fast. So the fastest yeah. way that I learned was um, learning from the best people in the um, in the LinkedIn world. Um, a couple of my mentors, one of them, Lorena, who has over a million, million, million point eight something like that. Wow. She is a brand specialist on LinkedIn. She was, she is still one of my um, best teachers um, in terms of how to leverage LinkedIn, finding people that you not want to emulate, but that can pull out your own uniqueness and encouraging you because for me most people wouldn't believe that I am an introvert I am yes, <laughs> people so wouldn't I. think that <laughs> they're like what I see you talking videos I was like mm -mm, I have to pull out my Sasha fears okay I, I, when I am off the camera I'm off like no that I'm playing my games I got my food I'm not doing nothing okay um I've learned that if I don't share I've learned that if I don't do storytelling, then I'm missing the mark of the people I can serve, but mm -hmm. also the chance to inspire someone else to let them know that they can do it. Because three, almost four years ago, I was on food stamps. I now average 10 to 15 grand per month, sometimes 20, depending on a good month. Um, but it's consistent based off of the brand I was able to build consistently. Consistently. That's now, cool. LinkedIn is just one era. I've been able to do that across seven different platforms mm -hmm. now. Um, so really learning how to uh, delegate. <laughs> I'm still learning how to do that because uh, I'm an octopus with my business. But also uh, knowing that you can do anything. And once you get the taste of it, you're not going to go back. It's a freedom that I literally uh, enjoy. Uh, being able to spend time with my kids, being able to uh, tell my other half, hey, I got, the, you know, I'm mm -hmm. good. Um, to be able to have the freedom. It's okay to talk about money. Yeah. It's a taboo in the social work field to talk about money. And it's something I had to learn. Just life in general. Uh, not just so, yeah, social work, to, to do. That it's okay to charge for your services. It's okay to do that. Um, and just be consistent with what you're doing and um, it will pay off. It may not in the beginning right away, but building. It took me 20 years to do what I did in three years. Mm. Um, building a six-figure business in seven months, being in major publications, getting the attention of LinkedIn, being able to leverage 
um, it took 20 years of being in social work to get to that point. So a lot of people are seeing like the accolades, the, all the letters and all the stuff, but they don't know the work, the hours, the, the time, the challenges, the losses that were put mm-hmm. in prior to any of that. So um, we all have a journey, we all have a story, but it's how do we leverage that? Um, combined with our personal experience, combined with our journey, uh, mm-hmm. to use that, and that's okay to use it, and not and be unapologetic about it. I have no problem talking about money, not all day. I like going to the Louis Vuitton store. Okay, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know uh, it's you know I I like taking vacations. I like spending time with my family, but I also love serving my community, and not just serving them, serving them for an impact, Mm -hmm. Um, knowing that I've helped a single mom or a parent or someone that's usually debilitated um, get a license and be able to start cultivating their own journey. It's not about me. It's about them. Taishira Maddox, you've probably seen her post. She is my social work mentee. Um, I met her during the pandemic. after she passed her boards, her master level boards, I started coaching her on professional development. Um, and now she has her own nonprofit. She has her LCSW. She is out there. She's on LinkedIn. She just had her number one bestseller. I'm nice. so proud of her. We plant those seeds in people. And I hope during a conference, I'm able to plant those seeds in my colleagues and know that, hey, you can do this. Mm-hmm. It's going to take some work. It's going to take some grit. Um, You're going to fail. And that's okay. Take those failures and keep going. That you may not be for everybody, but you're Mm. for somebody. No, absolutely. Um, You mentioned trademarking. Uh, The podcast (laughs) is in the process of trademarking. Uh, My my business page is hopefully by the end of this year or the very beginning of 2024, it'll be official a registered trademark and right after hopefully the by the end of 2024 the podcast including the logo be uh trademarked that as well so yeah you gotta yes, protect i'm telling you i'm telling you got yes i've learned the hard way i'm telling you <laughs> yeah gotta protect your stuff and for, yeah. and for me I, i've told people and i've been telling more people about it, like for me i was always in it for for the income even sometimes it's more than the outcome because that's how I even got into social work in the first place. Like it was like literally like six months after nine eleven, I got into those social work and it was like I needed a job. Like like nine eleven kind of like messed up like my original plans of what I wanted to do and wasn't even thinking about social work. I don't even have a, a bachelor's in social work and like. It was like, okay, here's this job. It's gonna be in a foster care agency. I'm like, I'll take it. Like, I need some money in my pocket. And so, like, yeah, right. And, I mean, and then, like, six months you later, you know, you no, know, they made me. I was six months of the temp work. I was about to quit. I was like, I'm not doing another month. And they put me on the payroll. And then, like, I seen all these people with their MSWs. Like, what's that? And like, they getting supervisor positions. So, like, I guess I gotta go to school get my MSW because I need to make some more money. <laughs> and it's like I did that. So, like, money has always been like a motivating factor. It's like, I need to make more more money. And then once I like got engaged, got married, it was like, no, I need to make some more money. And then I had a kid. Like, definitely, <laughs> I need to make some money because diapers and formula are expensive. And you mentioned colicky over. My son was super colicky uh this first like a few months up to like six months and that that is not a fun experience um luckily lord he, no he grew out of that and, and but you know that that was rough so i was always in mind okay what's the next step in terms of like a job or whatever in terms of like making some more money why having my my son in mind like all right like there's might be daycare or whatever like i need a job that i could like have a little bit of flexibility if i gotta bounce and take care of the wife and, and the child that okay I, I do that so uh i've always been the income driven as much as serving serving my clients and helping my clients out so 
That's so like I, I don't get why all those people like we're not in it for the income. Like no, we have to, especially now in twenty twenty three, like post post band post pandemic stuff and like the way the economy is and, and like I, I I work I work through the the uh the crash of o seven o eight o nine like and, and you know just, we have to we have to think about ways to make money. And I'm still learning ways of using my transferable skills to to make money. So. One of the other things I'll say, I mentioned LinkedIn, um, being in the, uh, in the position that I am in now, um, getting the attention of a university partnership. Mm. I would have never got that if it wasn't for LinkedIn. I was referred, um, we're in the midst of, negotiating um proposals and things now but that was always my dream um is to work directly with students come that are in school because they're not i mean i love my colleagues don't mind you um no matter where they are in the career path but i had a, a guy um his name is derek he was in grad school this is a good reason why it's like grad students you know coming out of school take your exam you shouldn't because they're fresh-minded mm -hmm. and right now the way the exam is built it's not built for seasoned social workers because once you have experience, you're, you're comparing, you've seen this, yes. you're comparing your real life practice experience to the test. And that's not the way the test is built. It's built off of book knowledge. And to a test of this, I uh, had a guy named Derek. He passed his master's exam the first time, 20 points over the margin. That's one of the highest mm -hmm. I've ever seen um, with the people I've worked with. Now, Derek doesn't have any test anxiety. He contacted me his last semester, this this past spring, um, he joined my exam group coaching boot camp, and I was like, "You don't really need much. You just need structure. You just need study material. You just need some support." And he passes. And I told him, "You are exactly an ideal of what I would want to see um, for my colleagues coming straight out of school." Um, because there's that other piece right here. You don't need a license. Well. Uh, it's getting to a point now that you need it in order to climb the ladder. Most jobs now require a license at the bachelor's, master's, and of course the clinical level. You cannot go far yeah, um, at all. Even I had a lot of <laughs> macro social workers coming to me um, regarding license. I once had a lady. She grabbed this late. Uh, she grabbed her master's degree, crossed the stage 4.0 in her license at the same time. She was in my study group. Mm -hmm. um, that's what I would want for most, and ideally. Was that my journey? No, it was a train wreck. And that's okay, because that was my story. Um, but statistically, after that whole thing came out with ASW last year, I believe in August, where they said the three people that don't pass, they're Black or marginalized communities, they, are, they speak a second language, mm -hmm. or they're older test takers, which means they've been in the field for a long time, and they're struggling with because of the, how the, the content is built. So I once had a lady named Mary who was out of school for 23 years. She's actually on a podcast, Mary Macbeth, and she passed her exam 23 years after her first master level exam. Mm. The episode was called Age is Not a Number. It's nothing but a number. Um, I remember her so well because she was one that was pivotal in showing my colleagues that are older that doesn't matter how old you are. It's your ability to believe in yourself and finding the right process for you that's going to work. What's the name of your podcast? I felt like I went off in a tantrum. Journey to Licensure. So people can find that on every platform, Spotify, Apple, uh, YouTube. There's YouTube podcasts. Um, you can just plug it in. It's there. So if anyone wants to check out any episodes um, of testimonies and stories to keep them uplifted, it's not about, hey, see what I've done. It's about listen to some of these people's stories mm -hmm. because they're amazing and seeing what they were able to do. I, I had a lady, homeless social worker, pass her exam on the first try, Zena. Um, there's so many of them. I can't name them all. Um, but what makes that podcast special for me is when I get an anonymous um, person from Facebook um, saying, hey, I passed my exam because I listened to your podcast. I ha I've had three of those so far. Mm -hmm. One lady, she was 20 points. She passed her exam 20 points over the margin after missing it by two points um, and say, reach out to say, your podcast was everything. Thank you. And I'm like, huh? Um, because originally I wasn't going to do a podcast. And this is a good lesson I want to, I hope people take away from the podcast um, of yours is that 
do not let your fear stop you. And this is what I mean. My podcast, I wasn't going to do one. It's only been out for eight months. Mm. It's at 141, 42 episodes now. Wow. I wasn't going to do one at all. Um, I, you know, I was afraid. And I was like, who's going to listen to it? Blah, 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 blah. Uh, weeks ago, I hit uh, my 100th episode. And I said, man, look at God. Um, because I stepped out on face and said, I'm going to do this. Um, I don't know what's going to come of it. I don't know how it's going to impact, but I'm going to do it. It's been a powerful tool in brand awareness um, of in, not only brand awareness for me, but even for the, the colleagues that I interview. So I'm definitely going to interview you <laughs> um, and give it, you know, it helps my colleagues get more exposure, especially if they're looking to monetize on LinkedIn um, because a lot of people follow me there. So now you you mentioned something very very quickly, I, and I, I don't want people let, like go over their heads. Is mm-hmm. uh, the people their their jobs and I work in a, a job um, that you need to be licensed, but you could get your license need a license even if you have a bachelor's in social work, and that's something mm-hmm. uh, 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 Delaware where, where I work at work at live at. Um, you know, there is okay. You get your bachelor's in social work. You got got to take the license and you get a LBSW, mm. and then you want to get your master's. You got to take the the test again and, and get the L- LM, and then you want to get your C. You got to do the hours and then get your LC. So yeah, there are a couple of states uh, that that have that. So I didn't want to let mm-hmm. that people go over people people say when you said LB, but like what's that because because I had to learn that and I had to like look it up myself uh, yeah because I see my my colleagues with LBs are like well what the hell is that like why well, you gotta need it you gotta and then I found out oh you gotta actually pass the test to, to start after your bachelor's <laughs> in social work that's, that's freaking crazy <laughs> yeah I've had that conversation with a couple of colleagues of mine they were like you know uh, a couple of them reached out to me for advice on like, hey, should I, you know, while well, I'm getting a master, should I get the bachelor level licensure? I was like, you plan on working? They're like, yeah. I was like, well, then go ahead and take the test so you have more opportunities presented to you while you're working towards your master. So, yeah, I get many people contact me for just advice and sometimes it's even beyond the license. One of the things I do want to uh, say on a podcast to social workers is don't wait to your advanced clinical license to start building, you need to be building at every single level of your career. And that's something I started doing way before any of this, um, using my job as much as they were using me. Let mm-hmm. me give you an example. Um, when I was at the partial hospital, when I left, I walked away with four, three um, national certifications under ASCW, 23 specializations um, as a clinician. Um, becoming certified in different areas that my population had as pain points. So long-term mental health, dual diagnosis, which is now co-occurring mm-hmm. uh, disorders, personality disorders, um, grief and loss, becoming a uh, certified grief counselor, but also being a sanitary play therapist. I was able to, because I had the luxury in my, my job to build programs, program development, based off of what the needs of the clients were. So if they're in a clinical special, uh, clinical setting, I tell a lot of my supervisees, you want to start looking for opportunities at your job because when you leave your job, it can't just be about what I did based off your duties. Mm-hmm. You want to start building based off of your needs. So you want to talk to your supervisor about what opportunities can I get certified in something that's a pay for part of my community, but also builds my career on the back end. So, because when I walked out, even though I'm not a therapist now, there's so many specializations that I have, but I also built programs based off of them. Mm. So at work. So I tell a lot of my colleagues, do not wait until you get to your clinical license. You're trying to figure out, you need to start building that now. Um, it's important. It's something I tell my supervisees a lot you know, based on where they are, whether they're at the bachelor level, master's level, to really start building those professional connections um, and really start building their, I call it the clinical tool bag. It's important. No, I like that. 
Now, since you teach people passing their their tests, what what's your um, you know you you seen this especially on, on on Twitter and Instagram about uh, and I'm a big uh, proponent of uh, the uh, the anti ASWB. <laughs> The, and, I have and, seen it, yeah. And um, you know, even like NASW is a like Illinois chapter and a few other chapters trying to have Chicago got rid of their their yeah their exam then, requirements. Then, and then DC is trying to do that now. Mm-hmm. Um, you worried about that affecting business in any way? <laughs> no. Mm-mm. Um, I oh, what, think oh, what's it? What's what's your your thoughts of, of getting rid of the, the licensing? exam well i i the problem to me isn't so i think it's they need to change the content of the exam oh absolutely um to me that's the bigger problem and when i think of the license um the whole point of the license is really to protect the public not us you know that's why that license is there if you have to think about what you want to unlicensed doctor performing an operation on you right so to me, there there's a reason why there's a license in place. I think the problem isn't so much the licensing requirements. There's something wrong with the content itself. That needs to change. Now, whether DC decides to throw out the requirements, the one thing I do want people to know, the bachelors and the masters, they're throwing out the requirements for those two levels, mm-hmm. not the clinical exam. So I want to make that very clear that the clinical exam isn't going anywhere. Mm. Even for Chicago, you still have to take the clinical exam. So even if they strip away the bachelor's and the master's exam, you still got the clinical. So that doesn't go anywhere. Um, it, I believe there's another state, I can't think of it, that you have to, geez, I can't think of the state. Maybe you might know it. That um, There was another state the recently. Exam that you can just get additional clinical hours Mm. and i can't think of the state right now for some reason i want to say it's utah but i don't i'm not sure i cannot think of it it's like you're gonna have me like (laughs) look it up (laughs) but there's a state and i can't it's on the tip of my tongue that um you just have to get additional hours um if you fail the lcsw exam the issue with that is how much time are you going to lose? How many opportunities are you going to lose? Yeah. Yeah, I see where, you know? where, where, you, where you're coming from with that. I guess there, there is an op- opportunity and, and even even like so- sounds good, like just uh, I'm a licensed, whatever, clinical social worker, I'm a licensed master's level social worker. Like, And then you just, just even like using your credentials to like maximize other opportunities that not necessarily have to deal with, with social work, like getting into speaking engagements and we got conferences we're, we're, we're doing. So this, there, there's definitely advantages uh, you know, to that. Yeah. It, it's so now would it affect me. I have multiple layers to it's just not the exam licensing I have, um, professional development, LinkedIn, supervision. So there's other things that I'm incorporating to scale my business, not just the exam. Mm-hmm. Um, the exam for me, uh, the journey to licensure exam prep was just the beginning stages of what I want to do. I think for me, I see other pieces, a lot of other needs for my colleagues, um, of things that I could be able to teach um and help them elevate especially when it comes to revenue multiple streams of income social media um and leveraging those things to build a brand which i've been able to do on the back end and have the social proof to back it up so no i'm not going anywhere even <laughs> if you know they do change the exam requirements which i think you know it needs something needs to change no absolutely so i'm not against that at all if they do change it I mean, kudos for the people coming through now because <laughs> my journey was just horrible. And it really is a depiction to the crisis right now in D.C. That's why they're considering it because there's a sh- social worker shortage right now. Um, people can't everywhere. get licensed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they can't get licensed since they can't get the jobs. And the other piece that is another barrier here a lot is there's a lot of pressure 
with employers that there's a kind of a, a period, a probationary period that you have until X, Y, Z to get licensed, mm. right? Um, please, the social workers listeners, please do not wait. <laughs> do not wait till you're at the end of your probationary time, like, oh, shoot, I got to hurry up and get this license before I won't have a job anymore. Mm. You need to be thinking about what viable choices you have now. So, you know, I hope they do make the changes in D.C., um, Right now, I can only deal with what is. There's still a license requirement at all levels. Until that changes in legislation, which we know can take a while, right? Um, we got to keep our grounds to the boots and um, do what we have to do. Right. And it's funny you mentioned that the requirements because I know like living in in New York, uh, I used to see like city jobs, like you got like 18 months to get licensed before. So people uh, really, yeah, a lot, it messes with people's anxiety a lot. I had a lot of, a lot of people. It was, um, to, it was to a point where it was transition. like, that I was like, okay, I'm not even going to bother applying for that job. <laughs> it's like, I'm not, I'm not dealing with that pressure <laughs> to find something else. Mm-hmm. That, so, so yeah, it, like it, it, it trickles down even like you trying to like, change a job or I know I had a job that was like okay, while I was trying to study for the exam like, I'm going to take it I'm going to pass it and I'm going to leave this freaking job because the supervisor was a pain in the ass and it's like felt it I'm like oh man I'm freaking like stuck here like <laughs> I got to deal with this yeah. guy <laughs> so yeah it's, yeah it's the, a fight the I would real. never I would never want people to go through what I went through um, for a piece of paper right Mm-hmm. But it's what I had to go through at the time. Um, I would hope that they do make the changes that is needed. They're not supposed to change the content of the exam, I believe, and not until 2025. And that's yeah, I heard what about I that. gathered from their website. In the meantime, how many people can wait till 2025? I don't know many. Mm-hmm. You know, um, there needs to be a change in the process of not only the content, but in preparation. Um in terms of universities being better at preparing these students, um, I'm not a big fan of workshops. And the reason why is because I get too many people contacting, like, I did this one day workshop. You know, um, you know, and there's nothing, I don't want to say it's nothing against workshops. I don't like them because of how many people I've gotten that have done workshops, one day, two day workshops, mm-hmm. and there's no follow up. There's, and I know universities only have a certain amount of capacity to help, mm-hmm. right? Um, which I understand, but a lot of students in my experience, a lot of colleagues need a lot more support than that. Um, and it starts with how can there be a uniform system where people are getting help the way they need to, um, in order for them to succeed. Yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense. But... No, yeah, because because I always talk about how. The universities, like you, yeah, you're getting our money. They got the least you could do is when we're about to, you know, graduate with MSWs that help us, like, you know, gear us to to pass the the exam instead of just focusing on on uh, of you no know, study material that that you're literally biting off uh, a certain thick uh, book that a lot of universities like to use and have those like one day workshops based off of of a book and it's like you're not really helping the, the majority of people who have you know you no know, study anxiety and uh, everything else and the underlying you know no logical conditions or whatever that they they're struggling that they need to pass the exam and like they're out in the workforce or they might be working already it's like I need to pass this like you said pass the test so that I could keep this job and support myself and like we're struggling out here yeah, I would hope that that is my goal is to really connect on with, you know, um, universities in that way to be able to, you know, be a resource to them um, when it comes to until things change um, to really not let those students get lost in transition. Because again, there's a lot of noise when it comes to licensing after you leave the university mm-hmm. Um there's so many popular things that are out there, but it may not be the thing that fits for you. And again, like I always say, um, there's nothing wrong with self-study, nothing wrong with tutors. Mm. I think, you know, I've, I have 
a lot of great friends that are tutors and a lot of tutors that I respect, but everybody has their limitations. Even I do. I, I can only work with a certain amount of clients because I'm only one person. Mm -hmm. um, and because my services are heavily involved in coaching, a little bit of clinical uh, skills that I use, being an on-call coach for someone, um, I'm very heavily involved in someone's practice um, time from the time that they start coaching with me all the way up until the day that they test until I get that text or that call um, because I like to see things through and I'm heavily yeah. invested. So having for me a holistic approach where tutors are not able to be uh, or can be or where self-study program may not be enough is where I come in. Gotcha. I, I, I like that. And and again, uh, how, how could people uh, reach out to you to, uh, to get the help that they, they need? Can, they can find me on every platform out there, Facebook, TikTok. My website is actually, thank God, it'll be, <laughs> but hopefully by the time this podcast is being revamped right now uh, to reflect um, where I am in my journey now. Um, it's funny, me too. <laughs> TikTok, yeah, I, I went, and that's another thing. Make sure I know I have, I have to shout this lady out right now. She just became the top voice in, in web development. She is the bomb.com. Her name is Charlene Brown. She is a LinkedIn top voice. She just became one today. I'm so proud of her. She's actually my website designer. Her name is Charlene Brown. You can just look her up. LinkedIn top voice um, website development on LinkedIn. She is the bomb um, black woman. Um, she really does help people really bring their voice and brand to life because I had, I've had two website no-nos, two expensive no-nos, mm. um, when it came to websites, not knowing how to build one, knowing what needs to go into it and really wanting it to reflect my brand. Um, this is the first person I ever went to that I felt comfortable with to be able to now see that brand come to life in a way that I wanted it to um, from the beginning, but you know, you live and you learn. Right. So uh, yeah. Yeah. So everybody can find me on that little Facebook, TikTok, Instagram. If you go to TikTok, sometimes I cut up. So um, just beware. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of, I think my social is uh, cut up. Um, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, even on the weekdays, Twitter, Facebook, people reach out to me on all those platforms all the time. Awesome. So, I'm very visible. Thank you so much for your for your time. You, 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 you really, you're. She's out there, like you. She's all over the place, like I'm out there. I see it. I'm out there in these, <laughs> <laughs> I'm out so there these virtual streets. <laughs> yeah, I'll see you at the conference next week. In God's will. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for having me. Absolutely.